Hey, welcome to Got Books. This is your host, Timothy C. Ward. Today's episode contains spoilers for the psychological thriller Forgive Me, Alex by Lane Diamond. So you might want to hold off on this one until you've listened or read the book. And so I thought I would share the sample for the audiobook. I enjoyed it. I've read the book twice now, and uh, it's one of my highest recommendations for thrillers. So definitely check it out and then uh, enjoy our episode. Mitchell Norton, the man I've long considered the devil, smiles atop the courthouse steps and waves to the simmering crowd. He tilts his head back to soak in the sunshine and cool breeze of a late spring day, the tranquility of which stands in stark contrast to the circumstances of this event. The mere sight of him pushes me to the dark edge of my mind where sanity hangs like, like, like a balloon in a tornado. I stand in a shadow across the street, one amongst many in the crowd of curiosity hounds gathered to watch a monster's release. As my face blazes, fists clench and teeth grind, I can easily imagine the onset of a stroke, an aneurysm, a pulmonary embolism, a raging scream. Control yourself, Tony. I long to charge across the street to destroy him, no remorse, as if stepping on a cockroach. Only sheer force of will prevents my doing so. For seventeen years, I assumed this day would never come. How could they even consider releasing this vile creature, this very personification of evil? In 1978, Norton murdered innocent kids who'd barely tasted of life. He tortured two of them beyond their limits of rational imagination, for to imagine such deeds was to summon a devilry that we dared not face. Yet the jury held him not responsible, a victim himself to the ravages of an illness that drove him to insanity beyond our reckoning. He thus resides forever in the darkest pit of my psyche, chained to me in perpetuity. Now only two choices remain. I must cast off those chains or yank them tight around his neck. Yes, I must obtain satisfaction. The idiotic jury 17 years ago in today's flawed court system has left little recourse. No one else seems willing to deliver him to justice. I am willing. After all, this is what I do. It's who I am. Indeed, the devil himself made me into this hunter of monsters. What a sweet twist of fate this is, that I may still, finally, administer justice. He descends the stairs toward his waiting car with an arrogant swagger, watching the small group of protesters, the news reporters, and the police officers here to ensure a peaceful transition, as if to challenge them. His wicked grin never wavers. Oh, that grin. For seventeen years it has taunted me, punished me for my indecision, my incompetence. I missed my chance to kill him in 1978 to remove his damned head, simple, as if cutting a sheet of paper. It would have been a fitting end for a monster. Why did I let him live? Like whispers in a storm, those memories only tease at me now, here at this obscene and maddening event. I'm trying not to relive every moment of 1978. Every time I do, I feel as if swimming in quicksand, anchored by my constant companions, sorrow and guilt. I'm too damn tired, can't shake the confusion, the dread. I fear surrendering to fear. My life teems with just such wretched ironies. As Norton vanishes inside a black sedan, looks like standard issue law enforcement, I dash through the crowds to my van. Despite this call to action, my mind again zeroes in on memories of 1978. I recall the court proceedings, particularly the devil's own twisted testimony, as though it were yesterday. I've only relived it 10,000 times. Then, 26, Norton was a man-child who'd never quite grasped the nuance of adulthood. He continued to wash dishes at a restaurant ten years into the only job he'd ever held. He found it comfortable and unchallenging, perfect. 
He harbored no great yearnings, nor imagined exciting possibilities, nor sought lucrative rewards. Then everything changed. He said that was when his new life emerged, when he became more aware, even more intelligent. He better understood the world around him. He discovered what he called the purpose in the spring of 1978, and it guided his every deed. He claimed he became a man that year. I remember it quite clearly as the year he became the devil. Welcome to Got Books. We have another guest, Dave Lane, is going to give us a little backstage pass to what it was like writing Forgive Me, Alex, his psychological thriller through Vault Publishing. Uh, it's an honor to have you, Dave. Thanks for coming back. Thanks again, Tim. Happy to be here. So a few questions that we left from our non-spoiler interview, we can now fully fully uncover for for today's jaunt. So for psychological thrillers, did you have do you start with an idea that like a character, a scene, and then from there did you build out how did you prepare to write this thriller? My um, my first thought was really related to a, an overall story theme, which is what happens to a regular all-American guy starting when he's just a teenager if his whole world really just gets stripped away from him? How might that affect him? Then I started working on building that character, which is Tony Hooper, our, our protagonist. Um, so that was the starting point. Once I had a pretty good sense of who Tony Hooper was, then honestly, I just, I just sat down and started winging it. I just, you know, pantsing it, as they say, from the opening. And I just tried to create an opening that, that started me on the right path. And I probably spent... I probably spend a week, and I mean a solid week, just writing the first chapter. But once I got that where I wanted it, I outlined the next few chapters, and I, you know, as to have sort of a roadmap ahead of me, and I was off to the races. I'm sorry, did you say that you outlined the whole book from there or just a few chapters after that? Just a, just a few chapters. And this is the way it went for me through most of the book. Um, I would write two or three chapters and then I would outline the next two or three chapters and give myself a sense of where I wanted to go. And I'd really spend some time on that. I'd give it a lot of thought and um, really try to map out what the next two or three chapters were going to look like. Once I got to what I assumed would be about the halfway point, I skipped forward and I wrote the ending. I wrote the last couple of chapters. And once again, I spent probably a week writing those two chapters um, until I felt like I knew where I wanted to end the story. And then I went back to where I left off at the halfway point and I outlined from there to the ending. So I put some time and thought into how I was going to bridge that gap. And then I filled in all the blanks and, and did the writing. Do you feel like, so I do very similar to that. How many books I've tried to outline the whole thing before I start and it ends up like this. I start with a person, a scene, I start writing, I get the tone, and then I start like some ideas that have built from there. And I've got my first four chapters, kind of an idea. And then I freak out and I don't do anything. <laughs> like, I mean, on paper, it looks like I did nothing, but in my head, I'm like just tapping along, trying to get these ideas. And right. I feel this terrible. Is terrible. Oh, this is great. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, this is great. Oh, this is terrible. Uh, I know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's encouraging that you that you did it that way. Do you feel like 
you would do the same thing because so now you've got book two which you mentioned in our last interview you've already outlined and did you say you've outlined the whole series at this point well no so i i have very sort of thirty thousand foot view outline of six books so books two to five and that's in narrative form perhaps two pages per book um just to give me a sense of what is going to develop with the characters, what new characters will come into uh, into the scene. Uh, perhaps there'll be one or two characters who will leave the scene. Um, so uh, it's just to give me a sense when I sit down to write of what it is I have in mind. But once again, I will open with the first chapter or two and I will probably write it and rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. I don't know how many times I did that with Forgive Me, Alex, but I'm going to guess maybe 10 <laughs> um, until I really feel good about it. And then I will outline ahead on the chapters. I probably still will not outline the chapters more than maybe five ahead because I feel that the story quite often at the insistence of certain characters uh, writes itself in a direction that I really hadn't planned. That happened with Forgive Me, Alex, probably a half dozen times where I was writing it and I realized that I was going in a different direction from what I had planned, but I liked it better. And it just felt better. It made more sense. So I... I feel that it's a little bit futile, at least for me, to outline an entire book, because there's a good chance that by the time I write the next three chapters, it's going to completely change. <laughs> so so I don't bother with that. I try to keep it close. I, I do want to know where I'm going for the next couple of chapters always, but not necessarily beyond that. So how does that work with a time gap novel does it create any extra problems to that path or that plan to, to just do a few uh, chapters ahead of time and then go forward with the time skipping and forgive me alex did that create any issues yeah it was a major challenge so what i did was i created a i just used an excel spreadsheet and kind of had a left column right column and I had the 1978 story arc on the left side, and I had the 1995 story arc on the right side. And I tried to keep them where I never went more than two or three chapters in one time frame before I moved over to the other time frame again, because I didn't ever want to give the reader a chance to forget what was happening in that other time frame. So it was a challenge to move back and forth between the time frames. But I wanted the story arcs, the two separate story arcs, which are very interconnected, to move forward and to grow really simultaneously. Now, obviously, you can't have you can't have that in the same, you know, happening at the same time. It's they're 17 years apart. But I would do a chapter or two in one time frame, and then I'd jump over to the other and I'd move that forward and then I'd go back. And so I I try to I try it's two stories in one. In a, in a sense, uh, happening at two different times, but it's really one large story that just takes 17 years to uh, to come to fruition. So it was definitely a challenge, but my notes and my spreadsheets, I, I was quite, I was quite uh, careful about really tracking all of that. I, there were times when it seems I spent as much time on that as I did actually writing the story because it was so important for me to keep all of that cohesive. Does the 1975 timeline play in on books two through five or is that time gap going to change once we get to the next book? So the next book, book two, The Devil's Bane, is in a in a real sense is is a sequel to book one. So book one ends on a little bit of a a little bit of a suggestive note. I, I mean I, I felt like the story ended, but 
there was more that was possible. And so I tried to set that up for the sequel. And that is the second book. Beyond book two, books three, uh, three to six, um, one of them, at least as I have it planned right now, is going to be a jump into the past where we see Tony during his time in the army. I, I mention in book one, and it will come up again in book two, that uh, he joined the, and it happens right at the end of book one, but he joins the army out of high school instead of going to college. He, all of his plans changed. Everything got thrown into the into the uh, the wood chipper, as it were. And uh, it was very impulsive on his part. He just needed to escape, and he joined the army. And part of his skills that he brings to bear in 1995, much of that has to do with what he learned in the army um, in combination with his his martial arts training. So um, one of those books, I felt it would be worthwhile to go back and take a good look at his time in the army. I think what I will do is do something similar to what I did in book one, which is to say his army time will be like 1979 to 1983. And I'll, that will be one part of the story arc. And then Perhaps 1996, as an example, will be the other part of that story arc. So something is going to happen in his life that really forces him to draw on his army training. And so we're going to see some of that. That's the plan. Did you know what these special events are going to be? Well, I have it. I have a, a couple of ideas that I jotted down, but it's it's pretty loose. Um, it's a very. I think I have maybe a single page written on that. Mostly, it's a reminder to myself that this is the direction I want to take. So I I still have some work to do on that, but I want to get through books book two first, and I'm not sure it'll be book three. That might be book four. Um, we'll have to see. We shall see. Yeah. <laughs> so with book one coming out back when it did, yeah. picking back up into book two, how do you feel like your process has helped you? And where do you, where are you kind of working through some of those difficulties to get into book two and writing that? So part of part of that is just going back and rereading book one. I haven't read it, you know, cover to cover, but I've gone back and reread certain chapters where I felt I needed to revisit those characters or or what was happening in the story at that time. Um, so and then working on uh, book two, it's really just been read, reread, revise, edit, revise, edit, revise. And I've done that a few times now where I, I feel pretty comfortable with what I have there. And I'm now, um, as of the last go round, I'm really now fully immersed in the story again. So I feel like I can just barrel through it if I find the time to, to do that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, million dollar question. So for you, as a publisher, as a husband, and dealing with all the things, how do you find scheduling for a week and saying, okay, I want, this isn't my, maybe this isn't my main project, or this isn't, you know, as, as far as my business and family goes, it's not my number one thing. How do I block out time that maximizes my mental acuity and memory of what I've been reading and all those things. How do you feel like what minimum time, what is a good time? What have you thought so far? Well, I think in order to keep myself immersed in and engaged in the story, I need to at least spend a couple of hours a week on it um, to keep myself fresh in that story. But I'd like to try to find six, eight, 10 hours 
a week to work on it. However, I wear, really I wear three hats. Hat number one is publisher. If I have some publisher duty that has to be addressed, that has to take priority. Hat number two is as editor. I'm editing for a lot of authors. It's a little insane, but right now I'm editing for nine, I'm editing nine different books um, at the moment. So, and I go back and forth and I jump from one to another, to another, to another, and it's a little bit crazy. So um, my hope is to trim that down to two or three. So I've got to just barrel through some of those and get them finished and off my plate. Things have just gotten a little backed up for me. But I think I think I just have to make the time. I have to be able to say, you know what? This is important for me. So if it means that I'm going to get two less chapters edited for somebody this week because I want to take a few hours to work on my book, I, I think I just have to do that. It's difficult for me to do that. Um, it's difficult me, for me to make others wait, but this is important, and uh, and I think it's fair for me to to steal a few hours out of the week. Yeah. Well, it's easy for me to say because you're not re editing any of my books at the moment, but the team at Evolved, if I could speak for them, would say we would love for you to do what you love, and I think as as a partner in this business and also as my friend, I've appreciated you encouraging me. Um, the time that you've taken with me has encouraged me to have a better perspective, I think. Kind of like with what you're doing, it's like, okay, where, where are my priorities? And also patience is helpful. <laughs> like you said, I I have nine books and I want to get them done. It's, I mean, you didn't say this exactly, but I want to get them done as soon as possible. Maybe I don't have to get them done by tomorrow. Like, it's funny how we tend to impose those deadlines on ourselves. Um, I think so. if you're making steady forward progress, even if that's, I mean, if that's five or 10 pages a week, it doesn't sound like much. But honestly, look where you're at a year later. If you managed to do five or 10 pages a week, you, you finished a book probably. So I think it's just important. I Look, I, I get a lot of um, enjoyment out of helping authors chase this dream. Um, my work as an editor and as a writing coach, I've helped a number of authors improve their, their craft. And I've seen the end results, and it's it's fulfilling for me. It's something that I I really enjoy. I take pleasure from, and I um, and I take some reward for. Um, so it's not like I feel trapped or unable to do something that I love to do. I'm doing what I love to do. It's just too much, <laughs> you know. It's all of it is is a lot. So. It's hard for me to squeeze in that extra time for myself, but I'm I'm determined that this second book uh, I will finish it this year. Uh, I'm really determined. Well, good to well, hear. Good to hear. Back to, forgive me, Alex. So, was there any um, spoiler surprises that you encountered, folks that have read Forgive Me, Alex, that? just want to see behind the scenes did anything really mutate during the process yeah a number of things um first of all um the character of frank willow was originally going to be just a small bit player not going to have much to do with the story at all and mm -hmm. when i got to him and when I got to the point where I realized that Tony was going to need a shoulder at some point to lean on, uh, he just seemed the natural choice. And he became, he grew into something that I never expected. And uh, and I'm just pleased with the way that he turned out. I almost regret making him as old as I made him for future <laughs> volumes because you know, at some point, I mean, the guy is not immortal. So, um, yeah, but he, he turned out to be a, a huge surprise for me. 
I think also the relationship that developed between Tony Hooper and FBI agent Linda Monroe really turned out to be a surprise as well. I had never anticipated or expected to go down that road. Um, but when I got to that part of the story, it just seemed to demand it, <laughs> you know? It made the most sense mm -hmm. to me. And so once again, it, it's like, okay, well, this is what the story wants. This is what the story gets. Uh, and it's amazing how many times as an author, if you leave yourself open to it, how many times that happens. I would say those are the two big ones, the really big ones. The other stuff I had pretty well in mind as I was going through. At what uh, stage in the book did Linda show up? I can't remember. Where well, she that... has a very minor, very minor part, very minor in 1978. But she really comes back on the scene after Mitchell Norton is released after 17 years in psychiatric prison. Um, and he returns to Algonquin. Um, she comes back on the scene uh, knowing that uh, this is going to affect Tony. And she wants to be there to intervene, to help, to prevent something terrible from happening. Um, and when that happened, I then had to build in a little a little bit of backstory about them having encountered one another and crossed paths uh, additionally in the past, not just in 1978. So, because that was a very, just a brief moment in time um, for her. So she comes on in really hard and becomes an important character in 1995. Yeah, I I enjoyed their dynamic between her and, and our main character, Tony. Did you, um, <laughs> so, okay, so I, I want to change my question because I want to talk about Frank a little bit because I, I enjoy <laughs> Frank. I enjoy, it's, when we discover that he has some old military training and he, so he's kind of connected to this psychological experiment that impacted Mitchell. Am I getting that right? Am I remembering that right? Or how did I? No, um, he, uh, he comes, he comes out of world war two, Germany mm -hmm. spends a life in the, in intelligence services here in the U S um, is retired. He's he's an old man already at this point, and um, he brings someone that from his past into onto the scene when Tony needs a little help remembering some things that he may have seen that he just he can't quite pull from memory. So this is where we learn a little bit about Frank's past, his trade craft. And with the help of uh, an individual by the name of Art from uh, from Frank's past, who shows up and uh, and helps helps Tony go deep inside his own mind and remember things that he might not have otherwise remembered. Gotcha. <laughs> there there was a meme the other day that said like. I reserve the right to remember nothing about the books I read and not hold anything accountable to if I still enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> so right. that's that's how I read sometimes. And I'm listening to audio. So sorry. <laughs> but I do enjoy the the element of Frank and because it does seem like so Mitchell and the Devil's Bane um going into book two. What is the what's the mystery that you're focusing on as far as Mitchell still in this? Well, first of all, Mitchell is still out there, and he still feels that itch to do what he once did, even though he's cured. Um, I, uh, I really wanted to point out how the psychological sciences, if that's what we want to call them, 
are not really so much science as they are art. And what people thought they knew about Mitchell Norton, and perhaps even what he thought he knew about himself, was not exactly correct. And he is going to uh, rise up again, as it were, in book two. And then how does that affect Tony? Because Tony is obsessed with Mitchell Norton. Mitchell destroyed his world. And so he, and because of who he has become, what he does, his, what I call his special avocation, um, he feels a deep-seated burning need to deal with the Mitchell Norton issue. It is, it's a, you know, it's a burr in his saddle and he's got to do something about it. So book two is about bringing closure one way or another. I don't want to give away too much, uh, but mm -hmm. bringing some sort of closure to the Tony Hooper, Mitchell Norton dynamic so that one or both of them can move on. I'm excited to find out what happens. Um, is there, when you're looking at writing a thriller, is there anything that you thought as you're making your outline, you're doing, you're like, this isn't going to work for this genre. This isn't going to work. Do you ever stop yourself in that way and say, when you're outlining, you're like, nope, this is a bad idea. And, and what kind of, what would qualify for a bad idea as you're making your outline? Yeah. So, First of all, when I was building the relationships, first between Tony and Diana um, in 1978, and then between Tony and uh, Linda in 1995, I think I went a little overboard, and I had to back up and say, hey, this isn't a romance novel. This is a suspense, you know, a psychological thriller. Take it easy here. Pull back. So I had to, I had to really pull back on those things. I also, I had to... Um, come to the realization that I'm not really writing a, you know, some sort of a, of a mystery where there's going to all of a sudden be the, you know, nobody knows what's going on until the very end. And then it's, ah, you know, this is, this is not like an mm -hmm. Agatha Christie um, mystery. It's a, it's a psychological thriller, which means that you may have a sense of what's happening as you're going through the story I mean, I, I think there's a couple of twists and turns in there, but you may have a general sense. But the thrill is in the in the dis, in the discovery or the experiencing of that of that story development. That's that's what lies at the heart of a, I think of a psychological thriller, is getting a reader so engaged in the story, getting them into the characters' minds in a way that. They just have to follow through and, and stick with it. So to me, that's the real key. Hmm. Yes, we, as I was reading that, I thought psychological thriller. I am, so we're in Mitchell's head. He's going through an enormous psychological mountaintop. I mean, he is we're in his head. And I, so I really appreciated that psychological warfare of what it's like, what is it like to be in this killer's head? Why is he, why does he think that way? And then also Tony and uh, the emotional losses that he's gone through. Yeah. Um, it's, and, and it's the reason I chose, and by the way, books two and beyond will not be this way. They will be, sort of standard third person past tense novels but i i chose to stick with the first person present tense in book 1 because i wanted to i wanted to be able to be in their heads at that moment all the time and i felt like i achieved that best by keeping it in the now um it's extremely difficult to do well um i think the reason i ended up with 26 revisions or whatever it was, was because I really struggled to pull that off in a way that adheres to all the basic rules of writing. You know, we hear show, don't tell, and 
you know, keep it strong and direct. And I have all these rules that I had to really make sure uh, worked. And it's hard to pull off in first person present tense. It's just difficult. But if you succeed, I think it can affect a reader in a in a different kind of a way, a more immediate way, um, as they're going through the story. I don't really recommend it. I don't ever want to go through that again <laughs> because I don't want to spend three years or four years or whatever it was rewriting it to try to to deal with all those issues. Uh, it was really quite difficult. So, um, but I'm glad that I did it, that I stuck with it for that one book because being in their heads was absolutely critical to the story. How do you pull back from the romance to make it not a romance? Do you remember anything that, as far as like, where do you draw the line? I know it seems, it could just be, it's hard to remember all the little details you did, but do you remember anything you know, that guided that? Yeah, I, I pulled a couple of scenes out that were really about building their relationships that ultimately did not move the story forward, really. Um, and I had some scenes that I kept, but that I pared back by 30, 40, 50% because I just carried it too far. So what I wanted there was enough to firmly establish their relationship and their dynamic, but just enough for that, just enough. Um, and it's very subjective. I mean, there are some who might say it's still a little too much in a couple of spots. And there are some who might say, gee, I'd like to have seen more of that. Everybody has different attitudes about that. But my goal was to provide enough to really set those relationships in stone without providing anything excessive that, okay, I, I achieved that. I don't need to put more in because that's ultimately not what the story was about. Was there anything that you took from favorite books or what you were reading at the time that you were writing it that inspired you to try and in include elements? Um, any any advice that you took or is that even part of your writing process to take from the reading certain elements? You know, I've read so much <laughs> uh, that it is difficult to pinpoint one thing it's more of a more of an absorption process that that i i can't really point to any one specific thing because there are probably 200 books that that influenced me in some way or another in that story even if it was just for a particular line or paragraph or scene um i'm sure that there are those influences out there mostly i I tried to think of other thrillers and the, the line between the pace of story and character development. Um, I think, I think character development is absolutely critical, but you don't want to develop characters to the point where the story stops happening. So once again, you're, you're trying to walk, you're trying to walk that line and balance that. Um, and I looked back at, for example, some of the old uh, Frederick Forsyth books or John le Carre or, um, or Tom Clancy, um, Robert Ludlum, Stephen King. These were some of my primary early influences. And I, I can't say I pointed to one thing or one book or one scene or anything, but just in general, their approach to get from page one to page last in a way that satisfied all of those requirements. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I admire your history and your your wisdom. I when I read, I I feel like I'm trying to catch up, but maybe that's because I'm so young. Um, <laughs> I appreciate your your wisdom there. Any? Yeah, I'm older than dirt, so but I'm younger than fire. So just saying. <laughs> do you also read submissions for 
thrillers for Evolve? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I review all the submissions. Back in the early days, my partner Dan and I would share that load a little bit, probably, you know, 60-40. Now it's 100% me. So I've gotten much tighter. If a if an author doesn't grab me in the first couple of pages, I, I just I don't continue. I can't. Um, if it's not great, but I see potential, I'll continue to read through those first three chapters that are part of the submission process and determine if I think there's enough potential there that maybe the with the author doing some revisionary work that um, we can make a go of it. But I'm fairly tough on them. Um, we really, we're an open book on our website, on our submissions process about kind of everything. And I, I tell people all the time, for example, don't, don't start a story with setting. Don't give me two pages of, oh, what a lovely day it is. The sun is shining and, and the flowers are blooming because I'm already asleep, man. You know, there's nothing happening in this story. Um, so yeah. Yeah. If I get those kinds of submissions, I may not get, honestly, I may not get past the first page. Also, if I see a lot of mistakes, I mean, simple mistakes, um, then I'm not interested. If they didn't care enough to, you know, make sure there weren't uh, four typos on page one, then this is not somebody I want to work with. Uh, also, um, if they, how shall I put this? If they seem not to have any idea how to structure a story, then yeah, I can't, I can't move forward with it. Um, it's hard to explain, but mm -hmm. it's a tough business and it's really hard to sell books in this marketplace. We need good books. That's the Evolve Publishing brand. They've got to be really quite excellent. And so that makes our submissions process pretty tough. But obviously, we brought on some gems. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate the gems you brought in. I'm reading Confessions of Eden last night, and just finished uh, the second uh, C.J. Sears book. Um, ah. So, I'm enjoying my process. We have a minute left, Dave. Anything sure. that that you feel like high points? What you took from writing? Forgive me, Alex into the devil's bane fresh start get to do a second book what do you feel like you really want to improve with this one um i want to plug in the gaps on the relationships that are so critical in book one um so there's a lot more relationship development uh going on in book two uh, because it becomes the center of everything at this point as they seek closure and as they look towards what's going to happen in the future, there's going to be a lot of relationship development. How this cut off, that's my bad. I ran out of time on my Zoom call and now I'm paying for it. So that shouldn't happen again unless things just blow up. You know, you got to leave room for that. So thank you for Dave coming on and sharing his backstage pass to Forgive Me, Alex. We're looking forward to The Devil's Bane, the sequel that uh, we're hoping he'll be able to finish this year. Um, go over to evolvepublishing.com and uh, check out his book, Forgive Me, Alex. I've been updating wardbook.com, my new website, and have different book pages for all the, seri the series that I've written, including God's Knife and the book God's Knife Revolt, uh, which I'm writing the sequel for now. So thank you all for listening and watching. Have a great rest of your day.